The continuously increasing energy demand in today's world is an enormous challenge. With the world population projected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050, and fossil fuels becoming more scarce with every passing second, the search for sustainable sources of energy is more important than ever. But while research is being carried out in the fields of nuclear fusion and tidal power, one sustainable energy source that has been a constant throughout history is wind energy. Have you ever gazed out of your car window whilst driving through the countryside and witnessed these gigantic white towers looming in clusters on the horizon? Wind turbines transform kinetic energy into electricity and this currently powers approximately 12.5 million homes in the United Kingdom. But how do wind turbines work? The blades of a turbine have an airfoil section which produces a perpendicular force to the incoming flow. The same aerodynamic principle planes use to fly. The rotation drives an electric generator producing AC electricity which can be fed straight into the grid. The power extracted by the turbine is a function of swept area and wind speed. It's not possible to extract 100% of the energy flowing through the turbine, however. Albert Betts stated that The maximum theoretical power that can possibly be obtained with a wind turbine is roughly 60% of the power of the air passing through the area swept by the blades. This is known as mile limit. Actual wind generators reach three quarters of Betts at peak efficiencies. But reaching this efficiency requires large-scale engineering, and some people argue that these large turbines ruin the landscape. Smaller turbines would enable different power generation possibilities at domestic scales. To gain maximum power from a wind turbine, its swept area should be made as large as is possible. This is usually limited by space or structural constraints. The root is unable to withstand the stresses of a more massive and fast moving tip. A long, slender blade is also more aerodynamically efficient than a shorter, broader alternative. But how many blades should there be? The answer may at first seem to be as many as possible, since more blades means more energy generated from the flow. This logic holds for a small number of blades at slow speeds, but doesn't work when the number of blade, the blades is much larger than two or three, and when the rotational speed is increased. Behind each blade is a region of downwash, dirty air, that is carried away by the wind. A blade moving through this downwash suffers from increased drag and reduced lift, and so increasing the blade number and RPM will amplify the losses. A measure of how many blades a turbine has and how broad they are is called the turbine solidity. That reminds me, a second important parameter of the turbine is its tip speed ratio or TSR. This value is the ratio of the tip speed of the blade as it rotates to the velocity of the oncoming wind. Its target value is very important and is selected in the initial design phase. Moreover, when designing a turbine blade, it's important to remember that different points on the blade are travelling at different speeds and as a result are seeing the oncoming flow at different angles relative to the blade disc. To ensure that all sections of the blade are pointing into the local direction of flow, the blade must twist from root to tip. You're right. In fact, a final design consideration is the amount of structural deflection that the turbine blade undergoes during operation. Due to the massive loads placed on the blades of large wind turbines, they are often designed with some forward bend so that when the wind pushes against them, they deform into their intended shape rather than starting as designed and bending away from their optimal position on their globe. The design process often involves a trade-off between optimization and design constraints. Our challenge was simple. Design a single piece, 3D printed turbine to generate maximum power in 12 meters per second of wind. The L2 project requirements were a clockwise spinning horizontal axis turbine with a maximum RPM less than 3000 and the maximum power to be obtained at a tip speed ratio between 3 and 8. Furthermore, the 3D printed assembly must fit within a 400 by 150 by 75mm enclosure. The first decision was the number of blades. We decided on two bladed design for a balance between minimising downwash effects and maximising solidity. Increasing solidity of the blades would decrease the maximum RPM of the turbine, reducing structural loads and keeping the TSR to a reasonable value. An earlier decision was to aim for a TSR of 5.5 at maximum power. To maximise swept area within the printing constraints, the hub had a folding mechanism and was printed in a folded position. 
you can see the allowable dimensions as a box around the turbine. Another reason for two blades was a simpler hinge design. With no prior experience of 3D printing in the team, we wanted to get it right first time, and a three-bladed design would have been more risky. At this point, we knew the approximate dimensions and design speed of our turbine blades, and could choose the aerofoil type that we were going to use. To start with, we worked out the range of Reynolds numbers of the flow along the blade span. We then looked for blade sections commonly used in small wind turbines like ours and selected those with the best lift to drag ratios about these Reynolds numbers. In the end, we chose to use two different aerofoil sections along the length of each blade, the AH7476 near the root and E63 at the tip. This allows for a thinner and more efficient blade to be used at the tip whilst keeping the root stiff and strong. We chose to set the spanwise cords by the Schmitz function. The purpose of varying cord length is to keep circulation constant along the blade to reduce losses. The blade twist was also found using a formula given by Schmitz, so that the blade was at the optimal angle of attack when operating at design speed. Originality was something to go for in this project. A large source of drag on the turbine is from the hub and the interference from this onto the blades. We took inspiration from boundary layer energising golf ball dimples to try to mitigate some of the drag of this necessary part of the design. The dimples on the surface of a golf ball provide surface roughness and hence encourage transition of the boundary layer from laminar to turbulent. When separation occurs, a wake downstream of the body is formed within which flow instabilities occur, such as those leading to periodic vortex formation and shedding. The pressure within this wake is much lower than that upstream of the ball, and this pressure imbalance leads to a pressure drag force. Turbulent boundary layers separate much later than their laminar counterparts, and hence their wakes are much smaller. This means that the pressure imbalance is also smaller, hence the drag is lower. The designs were handed over to the lab technicians, who facilitated the production of the turbine. Meanwhile, the metal hexagonal hub to join the printed turbine to the test rig was also machined under the team's supervision. A combination of CNC milling machines, lathes and drills were used to get the final piece. The 3D printing took around 36 hours. It was important to orientate the blade in such a way that the print bead was radial so that the final laminate would be of maximum strength in that direction to survive the centripetal loads. Sanding was then required to give the turbine a smooth finish, which would help in reducing screen friction, ultimately reducing drag during the testing. So now it was time to test the turbine. This was done in the Donald Campbell wind tunnel, where the turbine was mounted to the test rig and subjected to four different wind speeds of 6, 8, 10 and 12 meters per second. The power generated was measured by a torque transducer, while the blade was decelerated to stall by a hysteresis brake. Finally, our wind turbine displayed a good performance above 6 meters per second. As expected, it performed the best at a wind speed of 12 meters per second, producing a maximum power output of 127.8 watts and a TSR of 4.24. This corresponds to a maximum coefficient of power of 0.26. During the initial design phase, we predicted that the maximum CP would occur at a TSR of 5.5 and the results correspond to this with an error of 23%. We succeeded in designing a light turbine. However, our analysis overestimated the stiffness of the ABS plastic and the turbine suffered a great deflection even at low speeds, which led to a stall at 1700 rpm at a wind speed of 12 meters per second. Thus, it did not extract as much power as expected. The deflection at the tip is inversely proportional to the bending stiffness of the blade. Therefore, the performance of the turbine could be increased by using an aerofoil with a greater thickness to cord ratio. Alternatively, a method for strengthening the material, such as the insertion of a metallic rod, or FPR, fibre polymer reinforcement, would have a similar effect. Nevertheless, we were able to test the turbine at all wind speeds without permanent deformation occurring. In conclusion, the turbine we produced succeeded in fulfilling the L2 design brief, however excessive deformation due to slender blade sections limited the performance of our product. 
the next generation of Group 1's turbine would be much more substantial in the mid-span airfoil section to build on what we learned in this design cycle.